Hey, good evening, season ticket members. We are very, very excited. You can be with us here tonight for about an hour or so. I'm Mariners broadcaster Aaron Goldsmith. And uh, we're pretty excited because this is a kind of a, a live Q&A setup with our general manager, Jerry Depoto, or as we like to think of it, a live wheelhouse podcast for a select few season ticket members. So we're thrilled that you can be with us. We're very excited to talk not only about baseball, but about baseball that we know is going to be played, <laughs> which has a much more uplifting feel to it, doesn't it? Uh, just a couple of quick pieces of housekeeping before we get going with Jerry. Uh, first of all, as much as we would love your input, and we've taken much of it already, uh, we think it might be best if everybody mutes their mics. So uh, maybe just find where that mic icon is on your screen and tap mute for us. Uh, and also to keep the show kind of moving along because we want to get as much info from Jerry as we can over the course of the next hour. We're going to stick with the submitted questions that you, many of you gave us uh, when you RSVP'd for this event. So we got plenty of questions to get to as we welcome in Mariners General Manager Jerry Depoto. Jerry, it's great to have you, man. It's been a long time since you and I have talked. How have you been? I have missed you madly. Uh, that I'll get out of the way really quickly. And the second is, I, I don't. I, I've only had a chance to see a couple of the the season ticket members pop up visually. But Ian, wherever you are, the I, I believe it's the Simpsons living room in your background, which I it's. You made my evening. That's, that's phenomenal. Loved it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and that'll do it for our program tonight. Ian, nicely done. Hey, uh, Jerry, man, like, uh, man, so much has happened since we last talked on, I guess, what was, we last chatted for the last Wheelhouse podcast, which at this point feels like forever ago. Uh, first of all, how excited are you that we are actually talking about a baseball season that will be paid, played, obviously a much shorter season of 60 games, but nevertheless, there will be an actual season this year, which is thrilling. I couldn't be more excited. It, we, we've spent so many months. So, I mean, it's three, four months now that we've been going through planning and budgeting. And, you know, thankfully we had a, an awesome six week, four to six week uh, journey in there around the, the June draft, which, which made this spring summer uh, shut in goes so much quicker for us as a group. And, and that's another layer of excitement that exists, but getting out to the ballpark last week and seeing the, the players back on the field and, and, you know, albeit fleetingly because we, we do uh, wear our PPEs that we do see smiles. And especially when the guys are out and, and first starting in their morning session, uh, it, we are we are so pumped about this young group of players and what they did through their shutdown and how they showed up ready to go and some of what we've seen in the early going but but most especially that we're just going to see baseball it's a, it's been so long and and at, you learn how much you really love the game when you miss it during this this time that it's been gone hey, you brought up the draft when when we last spoke you were very confident about the mariners kind of structure of how you're going to handle a virtual draft, a shorter draft, of course, but this was a draft unlike any other in the history of baseball. So we knew your confidence going into it. How did you feel after the draft was over? Uh, just as confident. <laughs> you know, I, I, we could not have been more excited. Going into the draft, we had, you know, we thought there was a some chance that Emerson Hancock was going to get to our pick based on the buzz that we were hearing in the lead up to draft day, at least the, the kickoff day with the first 37 picks. And we, we generally thought that that was too good to be true. Uh, this, is, this is a player who last summer we viewed as the likely first pick in the draft that, you know, he was at least a candidate, one of two or three candidates that we saw as 1-1 one, one, uh, in, in this draft. And, you know, the benefit to, I, I, it's, it's hard to, to say that a, that a pandemic is a benefit, but the benefit of the shortened college season to, to the Mariners was that Emerson Hancock, whose first couple of starts were just okay, uh, really didn't start getting it rolling until just before the pandemic struck and the collegiate season was canceled. The, the, the draft became a little bit more video-based and relying on what you'd seen in the past. And players who got off to a good start really picked up some steam and, and among them, you know, some players that went in front of Emerson or before our pick. And the result to us was that we got what we thought was the, the, the best, most polished pitcher in this draft. 
And we also got a, a player who we think is going to move very quickly through our system and, and not a talent that you typically get with the six pick in the draft. And I can say we're, we're equally as excited about the other five players we selected, just in terms of the value where we got them. None more so, I think, than Zach Deloach, who over the last year, since he went through a, a swing change, like so many other Mariners, uh, he, in the, the June of 2019, he underwent a swing change and, and has been otherworldly since. And a, a gorgeous swing. And, and he's out there, as is Caden Polkovich and Tyler Keenan, uh, with the with the major league players and our best prospects out of T-Mobile, and and we're getting to see what they can do every day. It's been a lot of fun. In my in my brief interactions with Zach, he seems like one of the most likable guys you could find in any clubhouse. I'm sure that your experiences with him have been exactly the same. Yeah, it's a, there, other than I think he believes that anybody not wearing a uniform with the Mariners is named Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> That's a, I, I, I did get a chance to talk to Zach on the telephone uh, shortly after we drafted him, when we invited him to, to join us in Seattle. Uh, wonderful young man. Uh, recently got engaged. So uh, 21, just became a professional baseball player, um, although it's going to happen in a slightly different way than it, than it has in, in years past. He's, he is already in a position where he's made a fair bit of money in his, in his young career. And he's now, I talked to him today outside the, the batting cage, the turtle out there on the field at T-Mobile. And I said, what do you think? You enjoying it? He said, what an experience. Uh, from the first day, he said, my heart was racing. And, and I said, your heart was going to race no matter where you were. It just happened to be at T-Mobile. And uh, I really do think that of all the gifted young players that we have, just sitting here watching a 60-player pool work out on a daily basis, Zach's swing does stand out as it's just a, an aesthetically pretty swing. And it's so easy to watch. I, I told him today, it's hard to imagine disrupting the swing. And he's, uh, he's, he's an advanced player. We think he too will move pretty quickly, plays all three outfield spots, runs on, a, on an 80 scale. We see him as a 55, 60 runner, uh, throws average. We feel like he can play center, has the ability to move to, to either other, uh, of the other two spots won the, the Cape Cod League batting championship last summer with a wood bat and doesn't seem to have skipped a beat in this early spring, was, was crushing it at Texas A&M in the early uh, going in, in college baseball this year. And are you saying that he thinks that there are more than one Jerry's walking around the ballpark? As I understand it, he has had multiple conversations with, with our non-uniform personnel, me, me being the, the first of them other than Scott Hunter. with uh, and, and I talked to him for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and identified myself as Jerry, signed off as Jerry. He called me Jerry multiple times. And, and as I understand it, in the time since, a couple of non-uniform personnel have called him, and he has said, really appreciate it, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so, you know, it's a lot of people, a lot of people to get to know, man, a lot of people in a short amount of time. Hey, we're going to start to kind of sprinkle in some questions that have been submitted by you all season ticket members. And since we're talking the draft, Jerry, uh, Ian Razor has an interesting question, and I know this is something that every general manager, every uh, scouting director, when it comes to the draft, you, you've got your big board, you've got your whiteboard of your, your players and how you've ranked them. And, and Ian's curious, did you consider drafting a position player in the first round? Emerson, obviously a starting pitcher. How did you decide on pitcher over position player? Yeah, baseball is funny. I mean, to, to answer the question directly, we did. You know, we did consider taking a position player. Uh, I guess most specifically, there were three players that we had narrowed down. Uh, as knowing that you have the six pick, it makes it particularly easy to to determine who your 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 target group is in the in the draft room. You know, we knew going in that we weren't going to have a crack at Spencer Torkelson, so uh, we focused on everything thereafter. So we were building a group of five or six players, realizing we are going to get one of these five or six players. And, and uh, you know, th that group included Emerson Hancock. We did talk about a few of the players that went in front of us. I guess most notably as he started to slide was, uh, was Austin Martin with the, uh, from Vanderbilt and Nick Gonzalez, who went right after us to the Pittsburgh Pirates. Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, you know, Nick was the guy we had extensive work done on. You know, Austin, we have watched since he was in high school, and we just felt very comfortable with the player one way or the other. 
And we also considered a high school outfielder by the name of Robert Hassel, who ultimately went to the Padres. And, you know, those were the, those were the players in this draft class that we, we typically focused on. They all wound up going in the top 10 picks. They're all supremely talented. But at the end of the day, you know, in baseball, you do, you, you gravitate toward what you think is the highest feeling talent, especially at the top of the draft. You know, it's, uh, there's so much time that is going to transpire for a lot of these young players before they, they matriculate to the big leagues. And, you know, that might be a little bit different for a Torkelson or a Hancock or even a guy like Asa Lacey, who the Royals picked, or Max Meyer with the, with the Marlins. But the, the, the typical major league debut is going to happen somewhere between three and four years after they're drafted. And, you know, we didn't really put a priority on the, the quickness to the big leagues based on where we are in our, our growth. Uh, but we did place a premium on what we thought the ceiling of the player might be. And, and at, at the time we picked, we thought Emerson Hancock had the highest ceiling on the board. And, and frankly, the highest probability of realizing that ceiling. So we, that's who we took. You and I have had a, numerous candid conversations about how, for like so many reasons, why I'd be so bad as a scouting director, because I'm in, insanely superficial when it comes to prospects. And you, Jerry, you cannot consider drafting a guy whose last name is Hassel. Like you don't want to hassle like th this. You cannot do that, Jerry. So this is a good for so many reasons. Emerson was a great choice. I told Emerson this when I talked with him. We did a, a the scouting report video with it, which has been on Mariner Social. And he was such a nice guy. Like Emerson Hancock, Jerry, is such a great baseball name. And that, to me, that is like top line. If I'm going to draft this guy or not, I told Emerson, great baseball name. And he's, he said, you know, I've always thought it was too long. I'm like, no, no, no. The length is just fine. Emerson Hancock, it flows. It's got a big league sound to it. He's got a big league frame. Everything was an 80 grade pick with that, I would have to say, from, from my very professional opinion. Validated. But you, you are the Mariners version of the Velvet Fog. So it's a Emerson Hancock rolls off of your tongue like, like no other. I, 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 based on what I've seen in three decades in baseball, we will find a way to shorten it up for him. But he is incredibly talented. And, you know, I, I think I shared with you shortly before we popped on the air here, uh, he threw his first what we call touch and feel bullpen yesterday out of T-Mobile. And, and, you know, he hasn't thrown off a mound with any type of, of force in roughly three months. He'd been doing a lot of what we call flat ground work and just getting in his long toss and, and working on developing his cardio and, and building his body. And yesterday was his first day back on the mound and he threw a touch feel just locating at what would be a less than 100% degree of effort and and it was pretty awesome uh, overall and we're, we're watching it and and after he was done throwing uh our pitching one of our pitching coaches standing on the bullpen said to him where do you think your your effort level was and he said 75 80 percent with roughly a, a sweat being broken and and we, we do have rap soto uh loaded up in our bullpen to to give us a sense for how the ball's spinning what's rotating what the velocities are and and his 30 pitch bullpen was roughly an average velocity of 95 miles an hour. <laughs> I turned around to Justin Hollander, our assistant general manager, when we got upstairs. I said, what, is, what does 100 percent look like? <laughs> you know, just out of curiosity, because that was pretty, pretty special and very excited to see where he goes and so many of the others, the way they've come into this camp. Daryl Saunders, uh, Jerry, uh, would kind of like a little bit of a breakdown on the draft class. We've obviously gone fairly in depth on Emerson and also on Zach Deloach. Can you give us a little bit of a, a scouting report on the other guys and, and what made them so attractive to, to draft them and make the Mariners? Oh, you bet. Uh, you know, in the third round, we, we took, uh, well, I guess in a comp B round, which was the pick we got back for Omar Narvaez from the Brewers. Um, with that pick, we took a, a young right-hander from junior college, from McClellan Junior College down in Texas. His name's Connor Phillips. And Connor, we thought, had one of the best, uh, I guess, pitch menus, just raw stuff in this draft. He's, he's not as polished as the, the four-year college players that went at the top of the first round, you know, guys like Hancock and Meyer and Lacey. But the physical stuff certainly fits in that category. Uh, 
his his average velocity was among the, among the best in the draft. Sits around 96 miles an hour as a starter. Got a really fast arm. Has been up to 99. Has a has a curveball spin that ranks as above to well above average. Uh, on our, we we do use a lot of data in the way we sort through the detail. It can really spin a breaking ball. We're still to be determined on on how far we can come with a changeup. But he's just 19 years old. Um, we had a lot of interest in him leaving high school uh, in 2019. We maintained contact. We saw each of his outings in a short season. And you know, while he is going to have a little longer road in development and will likely be uh, a, a more of a year-to-year -year mover rather than multiple levels in a year, like you saw last year with the likes of a Gilbert or Kelnick, et cetera, uh, we think Connor Phillips has you know, a pretty significant upside you know, albeit a longer road to hoe. In the third round, we took Caden Polkovich, who is a switch hitting uh, middle infielder, has played all over the field, really. Second, short, third, center field. But switch hitter, uh, smaller stature, but physically strong. Uh, swings the bat hard and swings it well. Had one of the top five exit velocity profiles in the Cape Cod Summer League last year. His dad played in the big leagues at the the very end of my career, toward the late 90s uh, with the Pirates. And Caden, Caden is a it's, he's a pretty polished hitter, has a great approach. You know, we preach dominate the zone, and that's what he has always done. Hits from line to line, has sneaky power for a guy who doesn't, you know, uh, stand tall, so to speak. And we feel like is a pretty built out and complete offensive player across the board. He can hit from both sides. He gets on base a ton, and he has more power than, than you think. Additionally, he's a plus runner. So, you know, we are, we're getting a, a package of skills that really made sense for us at that point in the draft, and we thought the value was real. So uh, he was a guy that going into our draft meetings, we had pegged more as a fifth-round type uh, talent. And by the time we finished going through our discussions and breaking down all of his skills, and visiting with our scouts, we, he had moved considerably up our draft board. And if I had to pick a player from the start of our draft discussions to the finished who moved the furthest uh, on our list, it was Caden Polkovich. And ultimately, we wound up picking him. And you know, we're we're confident that we have the chance to get an everyday second baseman there. And he will be a very interesting offensive player with a speed athleticism profile that, frankly, if he doesn't turn out as a, an everyday second baseman, we feel very much like we talked about a year ago when we acquired Shed Long, that this is a, a really interesting skill set should he wind up in a utility role. In the fourth round, we took a, a third baseman by the name of Tyler Keenan from Ole Miss. And Tyler is a left-handed hitter who can thump. He's, uh, it, it's this is what he does. And when, when I, when I called him and invited him to Seattle, his, his reaction was not shockingly very excited. And, and I said, I look forward to watching you bang when you get over here. And he said, Oh, that won't be a problem. <laughs> so, uh, he can really hit and you know, he's a, he's a bigger guy and we see him very much like when it, it it's a player who's currently with, uh, with Toronto, but played the last handful of years with Milwaukee and Boston, a player named Travis Shaw, who mm. Travis went to, uh, to school in the upper Midwest, I believe he went to Kent State. And, and uh, when he came out, he, he was capable at either first base or third base, but he could really swing the bat. And, you know, that's the type of, of comp that we would have on a guy like Tyler Keenan. And, you know, his bat's going to tell his story. He gets on base. He's got real power. He swings from line to line. And he's got an idea of how to hit. And he's got usually soft hands for a bigger bodied guy. And we feel like between the two corners, DH, there's a lot of at bats out there for a guy with his offensive talent. And then lastly, uh, we took Taylor Dollard out of Cal Poly's SLO, uh, which, which also once upon a time delivered us uh, the, the Mitch Hanniger. And, uh, Tyler Dollard was one of the most athletic and, and precision oriented pitchers in the draft. Uh, incredible command of multiple pitches is the, not the type that's going to wow you with physical stuff, but has four average to 55 pitches on an 80 scale and locates them among the best in this draft. We thought among the top three 
in terms of pitch command in the draft. So while he might not have that all-star type ceiling and physical stuff, there's a separator for him with his field of pitch and his ability to locate. And we had, we had a lot of our, our West Coast scouting personnel that, rem, that he reminded them of, of Shane Bieber when Shane Bieber was coming out of school a handful of years ago. Now, obviously, Shane took a pretty big step from a stuff perspective, but those, that's some of the, the, or some of the traits that we saw with, with Dollar that we thought were worthy of, of a fifth round selection. And, that, and obviously, a truncated draft, we, we were able to, to land six players in a, in a short draft, but an incredibly rich draft. And we think we did quite well when all is said and done. A couple of follow-ups for you there. First of all, and I saw some of the t-shirts on social media, the dominate the zone t-shirt. So Jerry, did, did I miss like his, his dominate the zone, like kick control the zone of the curb? Like what happened to see the Z? D, like what, t- give, give me the insight here. What's happening? So C the Z got eaten by D the Z. <laughs> <laughs> C the Z, I've been, you know, I've been carrying the, the C the Z water since, since I worked in Arizona and, and you know, 15 years ago or so. And, and it's something we've always pounded since the day I've got, the, the day I arrived in Seattle and, and uh, particularly through player development, it's, we've really embraced it. And we were in, you know, this year, every year we, we host uh, a continued education seminar for our baseball people, our coaches, our, our training personnel, our, our managers, scouts, and front office. And, you know, during the meeting, we talked about C the Z. And, you know, somebody suggested, is there, is there, doesn't it sound a little passive? Like, hey, we're trying to control the zone. What can we do to really just, and we came up with, all right, let's rebrand. We're going to dominate the zone. And, and, uh, and it went over pretty well in spring training with a lot of our players. And, you know, it, you'll, if, if you watch tomorrow's or Friday's game from T-Mobile, it's right now we just have it as a stationary fixture up on the, the LED ribbon around the stadium, just reminding our players of what we're about. This is, this is our thing. It's what we do. And, you know, we throw strikes, we manage the strike zone and, and at the end of the day, if we dominate it, we have, a, we have the opportunity to go win. It's uh, the back of the T-shirt that the players are wearing. It says the count is king. I, I've, I've yet to meet the baseball player who was able to beat the count. The, the count just dominates the game. And, and if we dominate it, we should be in good shape. Hey, since you brought it up, we'll help spread some late-breaking news here on our Jerry Q&A. Uh, Friday, the Mariners are playing – a, a seven inning inner squad game. Is that correct? Seven oh, did I say that out loud? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this will be the first time I think in the history of big league baseball on the radio that an inner squad game will be live on the radio. I, I might be overstepping my, my bounds with that historic statement, uh, but it'll be a two thirty uh, airtime first pitch shortly thereafter. Uh, but Rick and I and Gary will be, We'll be in the booth at Team Oval, man, and we'll, we're going to be calling an interleague game. Do we have starting pitching matchups going for this yet, Jerry? You know, it's going to be a lot of one and two inning uh, bursts, but I believe the starting matchup, if I'm not mistaken, is going to be Justice Sheffield and Justin Dunn. All right. I said interleague. Uh, I meant to say inner squad. I've said interleague more often than I've said inner squad. So forgive me. Uh, yeah, so we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to uh, being six feet apart from, from Rick and Gary and, uh, and doing some baseball on the radio again, man. It's been far too long. Hey, another question I had, uh, not to dwell on it too long, but I was very curious from just a baseball fan's perspective. Uh, you mentioned, uh, I believe it was Caden and his exit velos in the Cape League. So, I mean, for people who haven't ever seen or been to a Cape League game, which is probably most people uh, on this chat tonight, and we're talking basically like drive to your nearest elementary school and like, that's the field. Like that's, that is the field with like a press box made of like the cheapest materials imaginable. Uh, these are just like kind of community fields, high school fields that the greatest amateur players, college players in the country are playing on for a few months. So Jerry, you t- do they have uh, essentially the equivalent of, of stat cast monitoring set up for these Cape league fields now that you guys are able to, uh, to track exit below? on these, oh, yeah. these very low level fields. Yeah, it's amazing how far technology has come. And, 
and you know the cape is is all tooled up you know there are wow. so many different good summer leagues around the country and we're able to get the data from from each of them and it's uh their agreements that that either individual clubs but more likely mlb enters into with these these leagues and uh they've got all of the the hardware and we wind up you know, just by by in agreement with the league and with with TrackMan or or the like, we don't do Statcast from from uh, the Cape, but we do TrackMan, and you know we personally uh, are able to to generate numbers from from Rapsodo, which we do get those feeds, and the TrackMan feeds from the pitchers that we get from from the Cape as well. So, um, and that's not just the Cape; we do get similar information from say the North Woods League. Uh, or other leagues like that, the advanced collegiate summer leagues. Wow, that's amazing, man. That's that's awesome. Good, and, and good for everybody. Too, man. We all of that information. The the roughly the the average Division One college baseball program also uh, they they are all hardwired up, and and we're getting that same information from them as well. That's amazing. That's great for great for the game. Great for everybody involved. Let's uh, pivot a little bit, Jerry, and let's talk a little bit about the season, uh, the forthcoming season that we are approaching. The Mariners will open up on the road. It's a 60-game sprint. Uh, the, <laughs> the trade, I was looking at the calendar. Like, there's opening day, and then this is an exaggeration, but like, like two weeks later is the trade deadline. Um, well, it's, like, exaggeration. <laughs> it's like right away. So t- tell us overall, like your, your feelings, your thoughts on just the way that this season is, is being, has been sculpted and what 60 games will look like in a major league baseball season. Well, I mean, it, it certainly begs the idea that anything can happen in 60 games. Uh, you know, I, I will say that I, I've heard multiple, and I, I'm going to say this because the, our, our, closest fans are on the, the line with us. We, you know, last year we started the season 13 and two, you know, through 15 games, we were world beaters and, and shortly thereafter the world beat us. <laughs> so it, it, it came down to earth a little. So over a 60 game stretch, you are going to see things even out, but anomalies will happen. Uh, what we're trying to do, and this is very much in line with, with the plan that we've laid out for our own growth and, the rebuild that we're presently in. We think it's going exceedingly well. And with the, with the, I guess the idea of a 60 game season gives us the, anybody can just train their eye on that 60 game season, say, we got a shot, let's do X, Y, and Z. And we're trying to look at this, not just as a 60 game season, but as an 18 month development cycle. And, you know, we know that the, the plan for us in the first half of 2020 was to give exposure to our young players, to allow them to accumulate the innings and the at-bats that were going to be required for their ongoing development. And, and I don't want to just assume that because we got four months older, we're four months better and more experienced. We, we have to remember that, you know, in as much as we still think our, our rebuild is, is very much on pace, we do have to make up for that lost time. And, you know, very likely for us, the the 60 game stretch is about giving the the playing time to the Evan Whites and Kyle Lewis's and Jake Fraley's and Justice Sheffield's and Justin Dunn's of the world, etc. And ensuring that when we hit the ground in spring of 2021, the, the 2020 season was a benefit to us. And if along the way, it should be that fortune smiles on us in a 60 game season, then we will be thrilled. But Right now, we are generally looking at, we thought that the midpoint right about now, you know, the all-star break of of 2020 would be the time that we would progress the next stage of young player to our roster. And that you'd really start seeing that that championship nucleus start to to show up and and become highly competitive. I, I, I don't know if that's realistic for us. You know, Logan Gilbert hasn't thrown an inning this year. Uh, we would have expected that he'd be in the big leagues right about now. Um, we, we've not seen Jared Kelnick take another at bat uh, more than the 92 or thereabouts that he's taken above a ball. So we do have some work to do in, in the realm of player development. And while it may have slowed us down a little bit, we don't think it has derailed uh, what we were doing as a club. And as a result, we're trying to take a bigger picture view not just looking at 60 days, but looking at the next 18 months and what that means for the Mariners. 
Uh, along the lines of the 60-game schedule, Jerry, uh, Loretta Wirtz is curious. What are you most excited to see in 60 games from the Mariners or in general? A baseball game. <laughs> um, you know, Friday, I'll be overjoyed. But I, I, the, the answer was kind of baked into what I just spoke about. It's, it's, it's watching Kyle Lewis. It's watching Evan. Like, I'll say this, that every day over the last three years or, or monthly watching the progress that Kyle Lewis is making is so encouraging. And, and you know, what he looks like right now at the ballpark, he looks every bit the all-star. I mean, it's a, he is athletic. He's running around center field in ways that we haven't seen since the summer of 2016, really. Uh, the way he's swinging the bat is very much the, like he was in September last year. But I will say that it is, he has a maturity to him and a confidence in the way he's carrying himself. He knows he belongs. And, and I want to see him take that next step. Uh, obviously, the entry of, of Evan White will be our opening day first baseman. That was always the design, and, and he did nothing in spring training 1.0 uh, to, to change our minds about that. And, and, you know, we're excited about that. We have opted to go with a six-man rotation for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is to preserve our pitcher's health. But we also want to make sure that we're getting the appropriate reps for guys like Justice Sheffield and Justin Dunn and bringing them along in a year where, you know, their growth is the most critical thing that will happen to the Mariners, uh, these young players. J.P. Crawford getting a year under his belt where, where he had the ups and the downs of playing through the, the fatigue that comes with being an everyday player. Watching him go into his offseason last year, put on 15 pounds of good weight, body muscle, come into spring this year and just light it up down in Peoria. And as we've come back here to Seattle, he looks every bit as good as he did when we left Arizona and really excited to see him play in a regular role. Excited to see Shed Long play without having the, the hiatus with the broken thumb last year. You know, for so, for so many really good stories in 2019 about young players who progressed to the big leagues, whether due to struggle or injury, we had so many of those guys that missed periods of time, like Jake Fraley, like Shed Long, like J.P. Crawford, and getting a chance to see those guys play for, for a 60-game stretch and just see what they can do is exactly what we wanted the first half of 2020 to look like. And, and perhaps they will, like I, I fully expect they will, they'll light us up and they'll give us every reason to be incredibly excited about 21 as well. Jerry, we had a ton of season ticket members ask kind of around the realm of the same thing. Uh, like Gary Welp, uh, Gary, you were wondering about this. Sounds like Aaron Healy, Ryan, you? Yeah. Uh, Aaron Healy, you were kind of along these same lines. Let's see, um, Eric Hess touched on this, Russell Hartness also kind of more along the lines. And Jerry, that is, what about all the other guys in the minors, right? Like the hundreds of players in the minor leagues that aren't on this 60 man roster for the Mariners this year, who you obviously still care about their development and want to see them improve, but they are not playing in an organized league this year. Uh, how do you continue to indoctrinate them into the culture of the Mariners and what you're building uh, from the, the ground level up? And of course, how do you just develop them on the field during this time? Well, first I'll say from a personal perspective, it's heartbreaking. You know, uh, these guys worked so hard to get the opportunity to play and, and to, and I'll say this, it, although he doesn't play for the Mariners, my son is one of them. That's, that's at home right now and, and trying to work through and, and keep his, his baseball skills sharp. And, you know, the, the group we have with the Mariners, it's, it's upwards of 120 odd players now between, you know, the, the domestic and, and Latin American groups. And we keep in touch with them regularly uh, through Zoom calls, Microsoft Teams, calls like this, where we go through anything from instruction uh, with demonstration on a, on a video, on down to just sharing some data points and giving them walking through a plan for how we're going to get through the next seven or 10 days. And it's a challenge because right now, as you know, we're not able to access facilities. And and we can't do it in groups. We have, in some instances, we have set up regional, uh, I guess, 
what you would call regional coaching seminars or get togethers with small numbers of players. You know, one of the benefits of, of having coaches who live all over the country is if we have players who live in a similar region, we, we have started to get the player and coach together for periods of time where, where they can get at least some one-on-one. -on -one. You know, for instance, that's something we did with, with George Kirby, uh, who was staying down in Burlington, North Carolina, where we have a pitching coach. And, you know, George was able to spend you know, a, a lot of time with, with, our, with our pitching coach. That is, that is something that we do fairly, uh, we're, we're trying to make it more a part of what we do. But outside of doing things virtually like this, we're, we're not really able to spend that active time. A lot of what we're doing now with our players is working on the, the development of their body and their minds and, you know, finding ways to improve concentration and mental skills, finding ways to, to engage off the field in, in whatever productive ways we can, and then really hitting it hard in the weight room and with nutrition and reforming their bodies to pick up quick athletic skills where that will ultimately benefit us in a baseball environment because right now we can't replicate too many of those small motor skills that baseball is re requires, frankly. I'm eager to talk to Jerry a little bit about summer camp, right? Spring training 2.0 that the Mariners are taking part in daily at T-Mobile. You know, it's funny, you were mentioning Kyle Lewis earlier and how great he looks. And there was this great viral video of him just hitting a tank uh, I guess it must have been today and just like just walking off, just leaving, walking to the dugout with a, like a There's face mask a on. story about that too. Oh, there is? Well, go ahead. Tell us the story. Yeah. So, so, you know, we do these, these live BP sessions. You're familiar with them from, you know, down in Peoria and it's a, it's a simulated game, so to speak. There's no real, there's not a, a defensive team on the field, but the pitcher's throwing actual live at bats versus the hitter and the, the catcher is generally calling balls and strikes. Although in our first current setup, the, the catcher, in, in addition to either Scott Service or Dan Wilson, are, are calling the balls and strikes. And uh, it, Taiwan Walker uh, has apparently been the, the, the straw that stirs the drink on, on, on getting guys into a competitive mode. You know, we're going to be in, a, in an environment for three weeks where we don't play another team. And that's, uh, we're going to, the first time we play, competitively versus a team not named the Mariners or wearing a different uniform will be on opening day of the major league season. And our taxi squad is then going to go into a period of time where they play internally versus Mariners players for the next two and a half months. So, you know, Ty was, was urging the players, Hey, let's treat this competitively, man. Let's, uh, let's get after it. Let's talk a little trash. And so it, it turned into a, it, the, the last two days, especially turned into a pretty vocal time and uh, you know, there's nobody in the stadium and the players are getting after it, yelling at each other and cheering each other on. And she was very, you know, very collegiate. It was fun. And, uh, and D Gordon, it, Austin Adams this morning was roughly, you know, something similar to prime Eric Gagne. I mean, they weren't <laughs> <hitting> foul balls <laughs> and, uh, and, and Austin was letting them know it, you know, roughly along something along the lines of striking a guy out and staring him down. And, and, uh, and D Gordon uh, struck out and asked the the fictitious third base coach to determine whether it was a swing or not. And the catcher, of course, determined that it was a swing, and they rung him up. and And he had something to say on his way back to to the dugout. And you know, Austin said something to him as he was going back. You know, getting after each other. And Kyle quietly stepped in the box, and the first pitch that Austin threw. Uh, Kyle deposited it and it, it, it was a no brainer right off the bat. And roughly as soon as he struck it, he just put his head down and walked out of the box <laughs> and didn't say a word. And Austin Adams looked over at the full dugout of players going crazy and waving them on and screaming at them and, and yelled back at them. It's about time you put a ball in play. <laughs> oh, okay. That's a good one. That yeah, was good. It was good. <laughs> you know, that's a great story. It, when, when you mentioned Kyle Lewis, uh, and I'm excited to get out there Friday and kind of see this, this group of guys that it's, I mean, it's like spring training, but I have to imagine Jerry, it's this much different feel because they're in the ballpark. They're in the ballpark, the big league ballpark. They're not in some backfield in Peoria. They're not even in the Peoria sports complex. You know, when you first got here, 
we're talking a farm system that like generously was 29th out of 30th, like probably 30 out of 30. You draft Kyle Lewis, right? Like this guy passed the eye test. He's got the resume. Like we, like the Mariners have got a guy now, obviously had the injury has to work through the minor leagues, has to rehab. But now you've got Kyle Lewis and you've surrounded him with just like a bunch of studs, man. Evan White, you already mentioned, obviously Kelnick, obviously Julio, right? Uh, these photos of Noel V. Marte that are going around, apparently he's 18 years old and not 28. I mean, it's like Carlos Correa is out there in a Mariners uniform. Um, I mean, it's when you look at it, Jerry, and you see it on your field, on the big league field, and you see all these pieces that you have, you and Scott Hunter and the rest of the crew have put together, and the years of kind of compiling talent is now beginning to add up, and you can see it getting closer and closer and closer. I mean, what's that feeling like? It's got to be a, a dream come true, really. Even though they're not there yet, you can see it. Can't, I mean, you can obviously see it all coming together. It's exhilarating. And it's been, you know, that's what has made this last week or so so fun is seeing them all out there on the field. And and you didn't even hit on the pitchers, you know, the Logan right. Davis and Emerson Hancocks and the Brand Williamson and I want then and I, I, Isaiah Campbell, who's looked tremendous. It's it, the, the group is so deep. And, you know, I was in Arizona. I worked with the Diamondbacks in 2006. I was the VP of player personnel. And and at that time, we had uh, we had the number, you know, kind of consensus number one farm system in baseball. And this this group reminds me of that group, but our pitching is way better. <laughs> uh, and that's and that's a lot to say because that that group, you know, produced Justin Upton and Carlos Quentin and Chris Young and Mark Reynolds and Stephen Drew and Miguel Montero. And well, we were we were loaded and 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 it and, and it four out and you know in 2007 there's just the very next year with all those players playing their first full season we wound up going to the NLCS and so when you get talent like that it can really hit very quickly and all the players you just mentioned they they really stand out and and even so much so that those you didn't mention which would be what I would qualify as just recently graduated prospects the guys like Shed Long and J.P. Crawford and and Justice Sheffield and Justin Dunn, you know, they are all, they, they notice it every day. And they, there is a buzz among our, I mean, our veteran group of 25 year olds <laughs> are, <laughs> are really, you know, raving about the, the group that's next in line as well. So, you know, they, there's, we, we've done a really nice job organizationally of building layers and we're really excited about where we are in the, in the process. And, you know, we're realistic about what that means in 2020. Uh, like I said, this, this is as much about the development of these young players as, as it should be, frankly. And, and, you know, whether we win 40 games or whether we win 30 games, I, I can't tell you. But I do think that what happens moving forward is going to be special with this group. And it's so exciting to see. Chris Soriano has an interesting question, Jerry. He's curious advantages and disadvantages from a player's perspective about a 60 game season. I guess that every player wants to play more. You know, I, I, I never experienced a season, uh, frankly, as a player or executive, whatever, a scout, I never experienced a season where on the last day of the season, I thought, Oh, thank goodness it's over. Let's go home. There, you always want to play the next game and the next day and then you want to go to scout whatever it is the next game and so i think the the 60 game season is you know widely viewed as disappointing but based on what's happening from you know globally right now with the pandemic we feel fortunate that we're getting the opportunity to play and you know, what i'll say is that every player that shows up at the ballpark i've also never experienced a day in, in professional baseball where you don't hear somebody complain about something. <laughs> you know, it, it's just, it, it, it's, it's natural when you've got so many people in, in a small space or environment into long season, somebody will be hot as a firecracker. Somebody's going to be struggling like mad. Somebody's not going to like the chicken that was served for dinner. Somebody's going to love the, the ramen. It's the, there's always something. And so far in, in, in this week, 
I've never seen more joy uh, among players just to be back, you know, to be back at the ballpark. We haven't heard a single complaint. Uh, and I, I feel like the, the, the appreciation for the game and, and what the players were, were missing. And, and I could say the same about our coaches and, and what is right now a really skeleton front office staff. We, we are really appreciative of just the opportunity to be at the ballpark. And I think from a, from a player's perspective, you know, you have a chance, you know, we saw just yesterday, somebody posted, you know, Mariners all time records for 60 game stretches, which were fascinating numbers. Frank, I don't know if any of you saw them, but like junior hit 29 home runs in a 60 game stretch. I, I can't, it blows my mind. And uh, you know, Ichiro had 120 hits in a 60 game, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, that's absurd. It's like a good career for a crummy player. But, you know, I think the, the, the idea is that in a 60 game stretch, so many unique things can happen. And, uh, you know, I, we are going to play what is already, you can see it. I don't have to, to walk everybody through it. We will play what is the hardest or, or second most difficult schedule in baseball this year, just positioned as we are in the West, that probably doesn't put us in a favorable position. Uh, you know, over 162 game season, there, there would be other teams that are in a similar building scenario as we are, and it would balance out a schedule. Unfortunately, none of them are in the West. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we are, you know, we're playing, uh, we're playing a really good opponent every night. And I think the experience that our players, especially the youngest of them, ultimately gain from playing teams like the Astros and the A's and the Angels and the Dodgers and the Diamondbacks night after night after night for, for three months is infinitely valuable. And, you know, they will learn very quickly how to deal with the adversities, how to get over those humps. And, you know, I don't, I don't really look at this 60-game stretch as a chance to set all-time records or, or you know, break – 60 game marks as much as it is about using that 60 days to allow these players to face better competition than they're probably ever going to face in a 60 game stretch in their career again. So uh, it is truly a situation where, where they are going to adapt to the very best of what major league baseball can offer. And from here, it, it can only in theory get easier for them if we can get through this, this 60 game stretch. And, and I think that's what interests me most about watching this 60 games. You, you've brought up the, obviously, obviously all the uh, precautions and the routine, the regimen that everybody around baseball has to go through now because of COVID during summer camp. Uh, Jerry, can you kind of, as best you can, just walk us through how, much time and thought and energy and effort you all are having to do on not just a day by day, but like minute by minute basis to comply. And I'm guessing in some situations uh, supersede what major league baseball is requiring of you all to do to stay safe. Yeah, I, I think supersedes the right word. And, you know, we, by virtue of being in Seattle, I, I think the, our city, our county, our state have, uh, have put in a set of protocols that hold us to a standard that's even above what, what we are dealing with with MLB, which is already a very high standard. So, you know, we are, uh, and we are handling it quite well. I could not be prouder of Kyle Torgerson, our new major league trainer, uh, head trainer, who's done a fantastic job as a point person. Joe Boringer, our assistant general manager, who's overseeing all this, has done a phenomenal job. And we're pretty diligent. I mean, you, you look out there, any video you see, until a player is doing something strenuous, like, like constant throwing or, or live hitting, they're wearing face masks throughout. And same is true anytime we're around the ballpark and, and we're taking every precaution. I now wake up every morning and, and the first thing I do is I go onto a, you know, an app that was loaded onto my telephone and and I answer a series of 24 questions regarding my symptoms, how I feel that morning. And I'll just give you my own personal experience. Uh, then I take my temperature twice and, and log it and, and file it with the, the league and, and the, the CDT. And, and then I go to the ballpark and I go through the same process when I get there. So answer the same series of questions, go through the same temperatures. 
every other day we are tested for the coronavirus and and the the results are generally provided within 24 to 48 hours so you know as the season goes on every two days we're going to have a a, a a very clear idea of if any of our players have been uh, affected and the same is true of our staff members and we can make immediate adjustments we have set up a series of protocols that that allow for uh, quarantines at various locations our players as you know are are staying one to a room and in a, in a nearby hotel we have we're making use of not just T-Mobile Park, but also uh, the link right across the street where a lot of our pitchers are, are getting their throwing in so that we can create space between our players. We are using both the home and visitors clubhouses to break up the, the players so that they're not on top of one another. The same is true of our staffs. And even when we do our meetings, all meetings now are conducted outside and there's at least two seats between uh, Mariners personnel when we are having those meetings. We couldn't be any more careful in exercising the appropriate social measures and distancing and, and wearing the appropriate PPEs. And you know, I, I, again, I couldn't be prouder of the group. And I think it's that type of diligence that's gonna give us the opportunity to play a 60 game season and see this thing through. Cause it's what we all want. Absolutely. It was, we are beginning to kind of near the buzzer here, <clears throat> Jerry, I, there's, Something that we've, I think we've hit on in a number of different points tonight, but I, I really want people to leave this meeting tonight and feeling really crystal clear on it, because I know, Jerry, you are crystal clear on it. And, and the question I'm going to point to is from season ticket member Wendy Lee, who is curious, and what I think probably everybody was wondering about when this hit and the season was suspended and nobody knew what was going to happen, is people are thinking, well, great, the Mariners have this plan, right, Jerry? He's got a plan. He's put it together and it's got an end date on it or a hopeful end date of when the Mariners are, you want to call it competitive and then a playoff team. And okay, does this mean that if there is no season or there's a partial season that that means that this plan gets pushed back X amount of months or years. And so she is curious about how COVID-19 is going to affect the rebuild and what expectations can be for the competitive team and the playoff team. And this is obviously something, Jerry, that, that you and, and everybody in your inner circle have, have talked to a great length, or talked about a great length, I should say. You know, and, and I guess I'll speak to Wendy directly, but to the group in, in total. The, the, the true answer is we're not quite sure. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we do, none of us has ever actually dealt with a pandemic, and uh, most especially me or any of our player development people. And while we still very much believe in our young talent, Part of developing young talent requires the, the, the game opportunity to develop that talent. And, and we've been without that. Our plan coming into 2020 was that the first half of the season was going to be about giving our players that, that experience they needed. And then feeling that in the second half of the season, we would integrate even more young talent, like I've mentioned, with the Gilbert mm -hmm. and the Raleigh's and the Kelnicks, et cetera, and really start cresting toward what we thought was a highly competitive roster at the end of 2020, and then augment that team through free agency or trade, but more likely free agency, uh, headed into 2021 and watch it take off. That, that has been our plan throughout. This certainly slowed down the first part of that, which is giving our young players those reps that are required. And you know what we're gonna do is just watch from today through the end of September, and determine how close we are to what we sh thought we would have been in September uh, were it not for the pandemic, and then decide what our off-season plan going into 21 is going to look like. Uh, timing is everything, and giving the, the players the opportunity to hit the ground running. We, we don't want to go add the – what's the right way to put this? We don't want to go add – veteran talent that is going to block our young players. We want to add veteran talent that is going to augment or enhance the, the, the young player group. And, and in order to do that, we need to know where they are. So the truth is that these next three months are going to be critical to, to evaluating our position. And we're hopeful that our youth and athleticism will allow the kids to catch up quickly but we won't truly know that until we get further into September and can truly assess it. And either way, I think you'll see that 
the group that we are building around as we head into 21 is going to be the foundation of our team. It's just a matter of how quickly we go to the market to, to augment that group and feel like that's an opportunity that may exist as early as, as off season 2020. It could be that it's mid season next year when we've seen this all kind of develop. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm curious, let's take a guy like Marco Gonzalez. I'm curious how, this truncated season affects pitching in particular, Jerry, next year, right? So Marco is coming off a 200 inning season. And let's say this year he makes his turn and, uh, every, I guess, six days now. Um, I mean, 10 starts, roughly. S- seven starts? 10. 10 starts, okay. So w- w- let's just say he throws like 50 to 60 innings or something, Okay. Like, can he, he can't the next year throw 200 innings again, can he? I mean, like 200 innings, 60 innings, 200 innings. Like, can that, can, can, a, can a guy do that? There's, what have been your conversations internally about something like that? It's not ideal, uh, which is, you know, part of the reason that I know, again, our, our, our closest fans here are, we are going to use a six-man rotation largely because we want to make sure that we manage the innings and, and health of our pitchers as best we can. We also know that in a normal scenario, you don't want to take more than roughly a 30% jump in in innings pitched year to year. So, you know, that's going to be a little different for for a player like Marco, who's more mature and built out. You know, I could say the same about maybe a Yusei Kikuchi, but if if they both do throw somewhere in the 50, 60 inning range, which is what I would imagine that, that we ultimately get to is, you know, 60 might be a rough get because in the early going, I think we're going to see some starts that are more like three and four innings as we build them up. Uh, but if they throw 50-ish innings and, and we go into next season, I think a, a reasonable target might be 100, 120 uh, for the built-out guys and less than that for the guys who haven't thrown much at all. So not only are we going to run a six-man rotation through the course of these 60 games, we've already wrapped our heads around the idea that, that we're likely to do that minimally for the next 18 months in order to preserve and, and develop our pitchers, if not just to, to adapt to that for the foreseeable future. It, we, we, th- we just think it's smarter, a better way to use our pitchers and, and, and keep them healthy and allow them to operate at max capacity. But that's another one of those elements that, you know, the, in a minor league season, and we'll use Logan Gilbert as an example, you know, Logan threw about 100 innings, uh, 110 innings or so as a college junior, uh, came, came into our system. And last year in his first season as a pro, you know, threw about 130, uh, 135. And this year, our goal was to get Logan to about 160. So we're, we're methodically building his inning count. This, this just takes that back to, to, to ground zero. And, you know, now in, a, in an actual baseball season, it, we're going to be fortunate if we can get Logan Gilbert 40 innings. And, you know, what does that look like next year? So we've talked about anything from six man rotations to using piggyback starters where there's just two starting pitchers every day. And, you know, the starting pitcher, if, if one is capable of giving us four or five innings and, and we bring in another starter in back of them, you may see days with the Mariners starting this year where, you know, the, the complete game is thrown by Marco Gonzalez and, you know, Nestor Cortez or Marco Gonzalez and Nick Marjevicus. It's, it's very possible. Hey, is the opener gone now? Like you're making me think about like, is the opener after all this momentum that I gained last year around the league, is it dead at least for the time being? I, th- I, I don't know that, that the Rays are going to allow that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's a, I, I say that jokingly. We're, I'm, sh- I'm sure that there's some team that still finds competitive advantage in that. We just don't see the, the logic in trying to develop young pitchers in that environment. We also are wildly concerned about throwing too high a pitch count um, on our starting pitchers as this goes along. It's, you know, and even in cases of our veteran pitchers, guys like Taiwan Walker and Kendall Graveman, they're both coming back from extended – time out with mm-hmm. Tommy John surgery. So, you know, I, we don't really have a pitcher outside of Marco and, and you say who we feel like even in the best of times was going to go out there and churn out a 200 inning season. So 
So we want to be really aware of what the next 18 months look like for those guys to make sure that we are putting them in the best position to succeed. All right. So this isn't, this isn't stump JD uh, because nobody has the answer. I know sometimes I just like to make answers up on stump JD. I think, I think everybody enjoys that more. Uh, but Jerry, do you, was somebody going to hit 400 this year? Is that going to happen? No. 400. That's, it's a big number. Although I will say that like the, in, in years past, I remember in 1993, I was a rookie in, in 1993 and, and into July, John Olerud was, was hitting a, not just 400, but it was like 420 or something going into July. And I thought, man, this guy's unbelievable. <laughs> and, and Tony Gwynn in 1994, which was, you know, it, it, so I guess I, I shouldn't be dismissive of it. There are players that are that good in a short space, but you know, I'm going to bet against 400. All right. All right. That's it. Happen. I'm, I'm, you know, it's one of the great oddities of this year. Uh, and finally, before we say goodnight, I, I know you are a great collector, which is something I love talking to you about. And I notice on your bookshelf behind you, this is just a total stab in the dark. This could be something. It could be nothing. You have a singled out baseball, which for a man with a, a lot of autographed baseballs, it's rare to find a single out baseball. Can you tell yeah. us what's, what's going on there? Sure. This one. Right? What do we have? So uh, there's actually a funny story about it. You will, you'll appreciate it. Can you read that? Is that a Tom Seaver? Of course. Oh, God. Oh, my God. No. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't see the, the, the lights <laughs> of heaven shining on it? So that, uh, th so the ball reads to Jerry with best wishes from your number one fan. I, I, got, I did say that in the right order from your number one fan, Tom Seaver, number 41. And uh, when I was, again, this dates to 1993, I was a rookie with the Cleveland Indians. And, and uh, we were at Yankee Stadium to play the Yankees. And at the time, Tom Seaver worked for WPIX, the Channel 11, which broadcast the Yankee games. And he was standing at the, on the turtle behind home plate watching batting practice. And I walked out of the, the, the dugout to, you know, grab the ball out of the bag and, and went to start playing catch. And I saw Tom Seaver standing there. And it's the first time outside of just watching him pitch from the stands as a kid that, that, that I'd ever seen him. And... Uh, and I, I just stood, I mean, I, it, it was probably an odd moment. You know, I'm 25 years old. I'm standing there like frozen in my shoes, staring at Tom Seaver, who's just watching batting practice. And a teammate of mine at the time by the name of Eric Plunk, uh, who played forever in the big leagues. Great name. Uh, yeah, awesome. Uh, especially since he was not a precision type pitcher. <laughs> he was too hard and, you know, he but Plunky came walking over and he stood next to me and uh, from Riverside, California, a uh, great guy. And he, he said, bro, what are you doing? And I said, it's Tom Seaver. And he said, he's just a man like you and me. Puts on his pants every day, same way. And I said, it's Tom Seaver, man. He said, he said, go talk to him. I said, I'm not going to talk to him. It's Tom Seaver, are you kidding me? And uh, he said, he said, trust me, just go talk to him. Take him a ball, get him to sign a ball. And I said, you can do that? He said, <laughs> he said, he said yeah. So I, I, I ran back down to the clubhouse. I asked the clubby for a new ball. I run back out to, to the batting cage and he's gone, you know? And, and uh, yeah, and a uh, disappointing moment. And it just so happened that uh, I, I go back into the clubhouse and the, the other pitchers are talking about it. And the clubhouse guy from the Yankees at the time came, he walked over and he goes, you need him to sign the ball? Give me the ball. I got it takes the ball, puts it in a little brown paper bag and walks away. And uh, it, that was getaway day. For those who are, uh, for, who are general fans of baseball, uh, Jim Abbott threw a no hitter against us that day in, in Yankee Stadium. Uh, and it was phenomenal to watch. I actually felt one up on my feet for the last two innings of the game thinking, no way, this is one of the most inspirational things I've ever seen in baseball. But uh, Jim Abbott throws a no hitter against us. We get on a plane, we fly back to Cleveland and we are playing a, a, an ESPN night game uh, when ESPN had games on frequently throughout the week, an ESPN night game against the Orioles that night. And Larry Sorensen, a former pitcher, uh, you know, pitched for a long time in the seventies and eighties with the Brewers and the A's. But Larry Sorensen walked over to my locker in 
old Cleveland Municipal Stadium and handed me a brown paper bag. And he said, I got a gift from a friend. And it was like 48 hours after we left New York and I opened up the bag and that ball was in the bag. And, and uh, I, it was, it, I couldn't believe that like, it was like the life of Riley, like my childhood hero is sending the ball across states with Larry Sorensen to, to, to deliver it to my locker. And, you know, immediately after the game, I called my brother who is also, you know, he's a year and a half younger than I am. And a, and a huge Tom Seaver fan. And I told him the story. And, and that's what he said. When he was done, he said, man, you live the life of Riley. And I said, it's, it's, it's true. I, I'm feeling it right now. And that ball has been prominently displayed under the lights of heaven since. It, it says right there. <laughs> in the show. Can, we, can you, like, center cut it on the camera again? Can we see that? Like, right in the middle? God, that's a beautiful signature, too. Golly. We talked about it. It is, it is the most beautiful signature in, in the history of baseball. Well, I mean, it's very good. It's very yeah. good. I do have a cool one. Since, since we're doing a tour, uh, I do have a cool one that is uh, also a really interesting signature. So th this one I got years ago, the first time I visited Japan. But the, it is, as you can see, it's Sadahara O, right? Yes. But then he also signed it in Japanese on the, the horseshoe ball, which I think is also really cool uh, how many how many what was his record how many how many did he smash uh well, i would say it was north of 800 right? yeah it was just okay sick number yeah i could wow. go on, but you, you guys don't have all night i got a i got a ton of things <laughs> so how did i mean i'm i how did siever did like did you instruct the clubby to write that did oh no, no, no did the clubby just say like hey this jerry guy is totally wacko and has multiple shrines to you and it would really mean a lot if you wrote this i mean that's incredible no it was no we were sitting down the other the, the other pitchers were talking about it and the clubby asked me you know you want me to get it signed give it to me i'll get it signed i said I, he, he's my favorite player growing up like my baseball hero so he, he told tom Seaver the story and that's that's the way tom inscribed the ball and i've uh there's later on you know i for two years in the mid 90s i pitched for the mets and um, when my son was born, the one I talked about earlier, he's now in the Royal system. Um, when my son was, was born, his middle name is actually Seaver. And, uh, it, it's, yeah, that's right. That's right. And we, we named him Jonah Seaver DePoto. And when I got to, to the ballpark, uh, after coming back, you know, I had a couple days down, I came back after, uh, he was born and there was a, a box of, of stuff sitting in my locker that was was dropped off at the ballpark by Tom Seaver, who lived in, in Connecticut, not far from the park, and was then working for the Mets by that point. And he dropped this, he dropped a box of stuff off at the ballpark, all for my son. It was roughly every Tom Seaver collectible that came out, you know, in the, the previous 10 years. And, and all, in addition to a, a, an eight by 10 photo of, of him as a player with the Mets that he signed nice ins inscription. And then he wrote a letter to my son on his hall of fame letterhead. You know, did, did you know that every hall of famer gets his own inscribed letterhead, uh, hall of fame letterhead, but not that's every man. amazing. Yeah. Not every man that is got, that's cool stuff. So he he wrote a letter to my son and made a duplicate for Jay Horowitz, who is the, the you, you know, Jay with the, yeah, band. he's got a book now. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jay phenomenal. He, he, he sent the letter and the letter read, uh, welcome to the world. Another K hurler. See you in Cooperstown. And then at the, at the bottom of the letter, it said PSJ. If young Mr. Seaver should make it to the major leagues and don the Mets pinstripes, he has my permission to wear number 41. Uh, and, uh, that from from birth until he went to college, that hung over my son's bed, <laughs> and uh, you know we didn't have we didn't have pictures of relatives. That was the picture. <laughs> yeah. Other kids had Barney. He had Tom Seaver. That's incredible, man. That's a great story. I would say a Harmon Killebrew, Stan Musial, Tom Seaver, three most beautiful autographs in order, obviously, in Major League history. I mean, you get it. All gorgeous. They're all, they, they are. <laughs> Tom's might, Tom might be number two, right behind Harmon. Hey, Jerry. Uh, first of all, man, it's just great to, to see you and talk baseball again. It's been so long. Um, I think you're coming on air with us on Friday. 
I don't know if you know this or not, but for I our, 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 our 230, 2.30 on air time for the uh, inner squad game, seven inning game uh, for the Mariners at T-Mobile Park, which we're excited to see uh, baseball in person again. Uh, but Jerry, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. Taking this much time late at night from your home. Uh, it means so much to me and the rest of the season ticket members. And uh, we always learn a lot and we really appreciate it, man. Thank you. You got it. Thank you guys. I really appreciate everything you do. And thanks for coming. And uh, to, everybody you, on the, to everybody on the call, um, if you're interested, we are going to do a virtual cheer. You can do this. You can opt out. You can go to bed. Go get yourself some dinner. Uh, but the virtual cheer is something that we will probably put on our social channels. We'll probably put up on Mariner's Vision in the ballpark. Uh, might go out on uh, Root Sports as well. So if you'd like to be part of the virtual cheer, just stay right where you are. And uh, Eric, our producer, will hop on the horn and we'll talk you through it. So thank you all for being a part of tonight. Thank you so much for being season ticket members. And uh, everybody have a very safe and uh, healthy uh, night, rest of the week. And we hope to see you at some point soon. Take care, guys. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Aaron. Yes.